Now let's go to the BBC and Michael Schellenberger reports that the head of the public broadcaster has vowed to pursue the truth with no agenda by reporting fearlessly and fairly. But as Schellenberger points out, that is simply untrue when it comes to so-called gender-affirming care where inconvenient facts have been consistently suppressed. Uh, he makes an excellent point there because it's not just how they report things, but what they choose to ignore. And, yeah. and there has been so much that has come out in that area where the BBC has just ignored inconvenient facts. Yes, well, and of course, there's precedent at the BBC on this. The BBC's own inquiry some years ago found that their reporting on immigration had been uh, off for some years. Uh, they were completely correct on that. And uh, Schellenberg is completely correct uh, uh, on this occasion. Um, as you say, Rita, the, the, the issue with a broadcast like the BBC is not just um, what they say, but what they choose to report, what they choose to make into headline news. Um, you know, uh, mm. maybe I've missed it. Uh, I, I don't follow the BBC that closely anymore. Uh, it's one way to live a happier life. Um, but, but <laughs> you know, I don't think I've seen or heard of headline news on the BBC about what, what so-called gender-affirming care consists of. I don't think they've shown mm -hmm. um, footage of uh, flayed limbs and uh, mutilated arms and much more. Uh, we just hear these, these cotton wool banalities like gender affirming care and um and the mm. fact they don't look into things like that tells us an awful lot just as for, for years the bbc would talk about about the plight of migrants the plight of migrants always never the plight of people who lived in the areas that those people were coming into who would undercut their labor undercut their their own um employment um, and bring all sorts of not particularly happy diversity into the neighbourhood. It was never that. It was never that. And so, yes, Shalimbo is completely right. This is this is a problem of public broadcasters, unfortunately. They're very, very susceptible to groupthink, and they loathe outsider opinion. Well, it's very true for our public broadcaster as well. And on the BBC, uh, I want you to watch this exchange between the president of Guyana, Dr. Efan Ali, and BBC journalist Stephen Saku. It's more than two billion tonnes of carbon emissions will come from your seabed, from those reserves, and be released into the atmosphere. I, I don't know if you as a head of state went to the COP Let me in stop Dubai. You right there. Let me stop you right there. Do you know that Guyana has a forest forever that is the size of England and Scotland combined? A forest that stores 19.5 gigatons of carbon? A forest that we have kept alive? A forest that we have kept alive. Does that give you the right? No, does no, that no, no. give you I, the that, right that, to release that, that all of this right. carbon? Does from... that give you the right to, to lecture us on climate change? I am going to lecture you on climate change. Douglas, the whole thing was superbly entertaining and, and illuminating. Uh, but fancy giving a smug global warming lecture to the president who's leading a country with the fastest growing economy in the world. Yeah, I, I've I've been interviewed by Stephen Sacker in the past myself, and that that that's his manner is this this endlessly um, uh, tedious, aloof BBC sort of manner, and they, they they sort of always think they're really doing brilliantly. Uh, guys like him at, at, at probing, and in fact, in actual fact, as on this occasion, they're actually very boring, and they're not getting to the facts at all. Um, thank goodness, Irfan Ali did. It, it's it's a very telling uh, exchange, and I'm pleased it went viral this week. Uh, but it's a telling exchange for several reasons. But the most important is the presumption that underlies mm. the BBC viewers' question. The presumption that we, with our COP uh, climate summits, all know what's best, and that you uh, uh, have to just get on board with it. Uh, you know, you have to fly to the COP summits, do your duty and fly back and do what you're told. And here is something that completely breaks that narrative. 
Um, I'm I was delighted to see it and uh, delighted to see somebody standing up to this. And it, it's a hectoring and a bullying way of going about things. Um, you know, maybe there's I always think that, you know, you should go into any exchange on the presumption the person you're speaking with might have something to tell you. And only the BBC interviewer, that type of journalist, goes in thinking, I'm going to go to tell this person, this head of state, how to behave, what to think, what to do. It's. I'm glad it, it ended. Oh, I, yeah, if, if you watch the uh, introduction to the interview that he gives, uh, you know what angle he's going to take. You know, he's wondering uh, whether this enormous oil reserves is a blessing or a curse. I mean, this is a poor South American country. Guess what mm. it is? It's an enormous blessing is what it is. Um, now, I want to ask you about the latest annual World Happiness Report. Um, it was released recently, and for the first time, America fell out of the top 20, and this was all due to the unhappiness of young people. Those under 30 are miserable, it seems. Uh, so the US is now ranked 23 overall in the world. But when you look at just the people who are age 60 and over, America comes in 10th place globally. But when you look at the under 30s, Douglas, they're ranked 62nd in the world. Why is there such a gulf between young and old? Why are young people who've grown up in, in an age of peace and prosperity and equality so miserable? It's very interesting. I, I'm slightly sceptical always of happiness indexes, but they tend to uh, mm. produce a finding that uh, people are happiest in the world in Bhutan and um, uh, unhappy everywhere else. <laughs> uh, I, I, nothing against Bhutan, but I, I, I'm a little sceptical of some of the methodology. Uh, this, however, does ring very true. Uh, and there's a couple of things, I think, that could be going on here. Uh, the, the first, the, the, the ungenerous uh, uh, assessment would be that young Americans have got a perception problem, that they are perceiving the world incorrectly. And if that was the case, you know, then what they need to be uh, asked is, among other things, compared to what? When you say you're unhappy here in America, where 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 do you think people are happy? Have you seen the rest of the world? Have you seen what other countries are like? Mm. Have you have, have you actually got your perception of the world out of kilter? You know, is the fact that your iPhone um, went down for a couple of minutes earlier today something that caused you stress? And might you not? have that all out of joint considering that you have a device in your hand that nobody had in human history until until now um but the second possibility is actually it's not a misperception problem and the gulf you describe rita between the uh the over 60s and uh and the people in their 20s and so on actually does point to one thing which which i think the american government and western governments in 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 general need to pay attention to which is that is that the inability, and I've written about this in the past, the inability to accrue capital among uh, young mm. Americans, uh, actually, uh, same thing with young Brits and same thing with young Australians, does have a consequence. Um, nobody in uh, their parents' or grandparents' generation had it easy, far from it. But the, the, the way in which, in which uh, all the sorts of things like quantitative easing, uh, money printing and inflation and much more has just eaten away at the ability to accrue capital is one thing I think that does actually cause genuine distress and 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 serious doubt in a lot of young people. If you accrue capital, you can get onto the housing ladder. If you get onto the housing ladder, you have a stake in your economy and in the market. I've been very worried for a long time that what we have are young people who are expected to be capitalists but who can't accrue capital. And, um, you know, the market needs to work for them as well. And I think this might be a demonstration, just one one reminder uh, that it's not working at the moment. Now, before you go, you've just spent a couple of weeks in Australia. You no doubt would have picked up on the growing culture of self-loathing among the political left here, similar to the US and the UK. Um, 
We've got folks here who very much subscribe to a black armband view of, uh, of our history. They think Australia Day is not worth celebrating and they call it Invasion Day. And this week, we selected one of these people, Sam Mostyn, as the Australian Head of State. Yes, our new Governor-General uh, has posted about uh, 80,000 years of Australian history with the vapid hashtags Invasion Day and always was always will be. Douglas, her appointment as Governor-General has been called an insult to mainstream Australians, but I've got to say, she is a media darling. It's extraordinary, Rita. I picked up on this uh, in recent weeks in Australia. This way in which uh, the general public are being told to feel uh, guilt for things they did not do, um, to have <laughs> culpability for things they're not guilty of nobody's been guilty of um and what we really have in these sorts of figures are people they don't feel <laughs> my friend lionel shriver corrected me on this some time ago and i'll follow her correction it's interesting that people like this new governor general they actually don't feel bad about themselves they love themselves they absolutely <laughs> adore the position they get to by telling everyone else in Australia that they must feel badly about themselves, but she gets to positions of prominence by trying to tell everyone else to feel bad and feel guilty and much more. It's just a bully's tactic. She happens to have worked out the way up in this era. Um, but I think, you know, I was very struck in Australia by this the demoralization that I saw and I heard about from a lot of of good regular people about precisely things like this. And people need to realize you did nothing wrong. You've done nothing wrong. Nobody alive did anything wrong. And if somebody comes along and tells you to feel guilt about something you didn't do, go and tell them where to go. Oh, absolutely. I know so many people who feel deeply insulted, hurt by things like always was, always will be Invasion Day because they love this country. And these yeah. uh, this sort of rhetoric has become normalised. In fact, it, it's been uh, treated as, as the uh, virtuous way to feel about the country. And, and it really, it, there's so many people who are self-censoring and not saying that this makes them feel uncomfortable and this is not how they see their own country. Uh, Douglas Murray, always a pleasure. Thank you for your time tonight. Great pleasure. Thank you.